Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's edition of Vertical Parenting. We're excited to be with you this evening. We are looking at seven essentials for building a family who loves and believes. And this is our second session. Last week we talked about what it means to have a new approach to parenting, the one that is a vertical way of viewing how you parent. And tonight our session's called Lead the Way Instead of Being Led Astray. And every parent knows the pull of activities and busyness and life itself that can pull you away from what you are focused on and what you actually want to accomplish. So tonight we're going to be talking about how do you get in front of this thing called parenting and life and lead through the process <clears throat> and not just be pulled along in the way. So I'm excited tonight to have, of course, my wife joining me. This is Hello. Heather. We've been married since June 2nd, 1990, celebrating 30 years this year in June. Right. Excited for that. And we have five kids, and tonight Hunter is joining us. So Hunter, tell us a little bit about you so I can get a, a perspective of how you fit into the family dynamics Please. and what is going on in your life. Yeah, so mm -hmm. my name's Hunter. I'm married to Brooke, and we have a five-month-year-old daughter named Adeline, mm -hmm. which has been super fun just getting used to and experiencing mm -hmm. parenting, of like brand-new parenting. But I'm the middle child of five, mm -hmm. and it's been a fun dynamic. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we're going to use Hunter tonight to help tell some stories along the way of some things we... Um, we felt went well, but also some things sometimes it didn't go so well for us and lessons we learned along the way. So uh, if you're in the process of parenting and you're with us last week, you know you have, uh, or we, we're assuming you've joined us and you've, you've started this process of leading from a vertical perspective. And if you downloaded the handout from last week, hopefully you've begun the process of working on some goals for your family, what it is that you want to see happen. We narrowed that down last week into three, that our goal as, as Christian parents is to help win the hearts of our children to love God, to love us, and to love others. And if we can accomplish that in our children's lives, not force them into that behavior, but win them into that behavior, then we will have been successful in parenting as God would have us parent. So once you have that in place, then you have a new motivation in parenting. This frames everything. This drives everything. This changes why you do what you do. And so much of life really comes down to having the why. If you've got the why, then some of the other elements can all be figured out. This gives you new motivation, new framework. It gives you a new way of relating to your children. And it gives you a way of measuring your process and your progress along the way. How are we doing at raising our children? Those three questions, those three markers become essential for us. So uh, let's ask Hunter a question here to kind of give us, um, again, some perspective tonight. Hunter, uh, Hunter grew up as the middle child of five. And so Hunter, tell, tell everybody maybe a favorite memory of growing up, something that stands out to you that would uh, help people maybe get to know you and our family just a little bit more. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of memories of growing up as a middle child of five kids. I kind of got to enjoy the or see the, the funness of being raised with Brianna and Holly and being lumped into that group and then mm -hmm. also being a part of Taylor and Truett and being lumped into that group. So some of my favorite memories was mm -hmm. really just our camping trips. And it was the, the first ones of just me, Dad, Brianna, and Holly and having the, the fun dynamic of like it was two girls and two guys on that trip and me kind of find my own identity of like being an adult, even of those, even though I was only like eight years old. <laughs> but then uh, even just transitioning and going from camping trips with Taylor and Truett and then being like the oldest one of that. And those are another fun memories. Okay. You get the best of both worlds being the youngest of the, of the first, the yeah. oldest of the last. So yeah. that's good. All right. So we know as parents um, that as life happens and uh, children come along, that it's easy to be pulled along by the amount of activity that happens. You want the best for your children. You want to try to make every activity possible. You want to do everything that's that everyone else is doing. But boy, in the process, it can be something where you get lost. You get lost in the busy. And when you lose your way in the midst of the busy, then some of the things that are most important that you really wanted to accomplish get left 
behind. And when this happens, you, you fall into a phrase that's been used for decades. Uh, when we talk about someone or in a situation where the tail is wagging the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail. And as a busy parent, you know what that's like when all of a sudden you feel like you're being wagged most of the time. You feel like you're being pulled along. And when that happens, the what that you're doing take over the why, and you get caught up in it. So um, a few of those ways that we mentioned last week, I want to mention again tonight, they're on the handout. Um, the tail wagging the dog happens whenever we get into this sense of having to keep up with being like other parents. And we feel like we've got to measure up, we've got to be like them, we've got to do what they are doing. Uh, it can happen when the home dynamic becomes child-centric. In other words, the whole house and activities, direction, energy revolves around the child. And whereas we're called to love our children, they are not to be the center of a family. That's not healthy for parents, and it's not healthy for the children to get a, this perspective of life that everything revolves around them. A child is much more stable and happy when they're in a home where the world revolves around the parents, where they set the tone and the agenda and life happens with them and their love for one another at the center. So uh, when a child becomes uh, the, the center of the home, that can be the moment where the tail is wagging the dog. Um, allowing fear or guilt to creep in, fear that, well, if I don't do this, and if I don't do this, and I feel guilty that I haven't done this, when that begins to plague your heart and mind, you'll find yourself being led away instead of leading the way. Or if you're trying to follow the culture, or if you're trying to do something just to be busy, uh, just to try to stay active all the time, you can find yourself coming in at the end of the day absolutely worn out and not having the energy, and you lose the why when the what's take over. The most powerful thing that can happen for you, though, as parents is when you have a home where you've established not just your direction, but you've established activities that are based on that direction. When that's in place and a home is filled with the love of Christ, with a mother and a father who are filled with Christ, then the children will be at a much greater place of peace and rest and ability to learn. So uh, let's just talk reality here for just a moment. Heather, uh, we parented five kids, and uh, we've seen a lot of life happen. And um, they are all, of course, different ages, and we went through some different stages in our life. Uh, talk about a time where maybe it felt like to you that we were being wagged instead of us doing the wagging, where all of a sudden it felt like uh, we lost or were losing control of the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I can definitely think of uh, probably many times that happened in the course of our parenting, but I think when we moved here to, to this house, um, we were pregnant with Truett, and so we had our four young children, and um, we also were doing a remodel here, and things got really crazy and chaotic. And I think we might have even had Brian and Holly in uh, softball at the time. And um, well, we were having to wash clothes at uh, my mom and dad's house um, with a family of six. And just daily going back and forth to their house. And it was a crazy time. So I really feel like those circumstances were really controlling us and... Um, I was ready to lose my mind. <laughs> well, yeah. Not to mention the fact that uh, Taylor was uh, under two yes. at the time, um, probably under one, actually, when we first moved in. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, I was involved in ministry at yes. a growing church, so I'm, I'm trying to be there and be involved. And that is one of those times where it felt like, yes. wow, this is... Uh, we this didn't is... have a handle on what all was going on, too yeah. many things going on. Yeah, and when that happens, then you start letting go of some things. You start letting go of some of the structure that you once had, mm -hmm. some of the discipline that you maybe once had, and you get okay with, fine, go ahead and just eat that. Fine, yes. you know, Go ahead and just do that. That's, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> as long as they're not hurting each other, that's fine. That's kind yes. of what you get to in that moment. 
And uh, whereas that may happen for a short period of time in life, that can't be a healthy way to operate your family. So, uh, Hunter, what about for you? Do you remember a time in family life when it felt to you as a middle child like, okay, things are kind of spinning out of control here in the family. This is weird. How about... (laughs) Yeah, because uh, it was definitely not one if we moved into this house because I was probably only like three or four, so I did not feel that exact same type of like tension about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, mine was probably more towards whenever I was in junior high as me just kind of growing up and trying to operate in a family of seven and trying to come up with my own conclusions about how who I was. Uh, I ended up just kind of with like a lot of tension stuff with school and with some of the other kids to where I kind of just like pulled away and tried to find my own identity in music. And that was my kind of thing to where like... It, was it, it the kids at school? or Yeah, kids? it kind of like okay. kids at school mostly. <clears throat> but, you know, it's just like classic sibling things that would sure. happen. And so yeah. it was like when I would come home from school and it's like, it's fine, I'll just stay in my room. Or I would yeah. get home and it's like, it's fine, I'm going to go for a walk for a while with my original iPod. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Well, it happens. Uh, it happens to every, every family, and it's important to recognize those times when it happens and then do your best to get in front of it and, and begin to lead again. And as we've done, um, as we did last week, and as we'll continue to do in this series, we turn to Scripture for our direction and our hope and to see what God has to say to us about how to parent because the Bible speaks to this issue. And um, though the instruction is written long ago, the Word of God is timeless, and it applies in every generation, and it applies to us today. So uh, Deuteronomy 6 is where I'll be reading tonight, verses 4 through 9, describes um, in the early law that God gave to His people about the basic structure of their culture, the home and the family, uh, God gives instruction. And so here is what it says in that passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Here in these verses, we have the most basic foundational principles for what it means to be family. These are essential for us. So a few thoughts about these verses, and then we're going to make some application for families today. Uh, A few things from this passage here. Verse 6, we see that this is for parents. This is not for the school system. This is not for the church. This is not for anyone else but parents. And we own the responsibility of leading and instructing our children, training them. It says in verse 6, these words which I command you today. These are for you. These are for you to own. Accept the responsibility of training up your children. And then he says that this is a a process. Hmm. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. It's encouraging to know that parenting is a process. Uh, It's not a one-stop, one-night decision that you, you do one thing with your children and you have completed the process of parenting. No, it takes time takes weeks and months and years and a couple of decades, actually, right. to complete the work. And so uh, it's a process that we are in the midst of. Don't be discouraged wherever you are in the process because it is a process. Mm-hmm. And then this passage reminds us that what we do in our home sets the tone for what our children will remember and walk away with. The fact that it says that you're to teach when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up says that faith uh, and a relationship with God was not a Sunday-only compartmentalized element. It was a full life experience. 
And the way you help children know that is that you teach it in a full life environment. And the home is the place for that to happen. So you you talk about God. You talk about his word. You talk about it in the morning. You talk about it at night. You talk about it when you sit down. You talk about it when you lie down. You talk about it when you get up. It's just a regular part of the conversation. This is how you help your children pick up faith and make it apply to their whole life. And then uh, this passage reminds us that this is um, not just a why, but it is full of how as well and full of what. You have a, a big purpose, but you also have now the, the decisions that you make about how you do that. And so every decision, every action that you take as a parent should come from your big why. This is what God's called us to. This is, this is what we want to see developed in our children. Now, let's build our lives around that. Let's choose activities Let's choose relationships and experiences that will reinforce our direction, what God has called us to. So for us, it was along this idea of we want to win our heart, our, our, hmm. we want to <laughs> win the heart of our children to God, win the heart of our children to us, and win the heart of our children to love each other. So with that in mind, now we chose activities that would reinforce that. And if somewhere along the way they became a distraction, it was all of a sudden time to reconsider that activity. And it meant continual evaluation. So before I get too much into that, let's move on to the, the second page of your notes there. And let's talk about how we do this. I've got some practical points, and then we're going to have a lot more conversation here during this section about how we do this. How do we even have decisions based on God-directed goals. Here's the first thing I would say and what Heather and I have learned. The first thing is this. Intentionally plan for times together at home. Uh, your home is the greatest learning environment for your children. They're going to pick up some things outside your home, but what they will um, process most is what they see most at home. So what we attempted to do was to make the most of meal times. Those were times that we knew we were all going to be in the same room at the same time looking at each other. So we had a big dining table, and we all sat down together at the table to eat. We all participated in the process of setting the table, helping put the food on the table, and then we tried to make the most of that time. Heather and I would use that time to create some conversation we didn't bring other devices, game devices, Game Boys, and Did we have iPod. Those? Well, what? early on, we had some Game Boys. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't bring those to the table, but we used that time. It was the time we modeled and taught prayer at the table. It was the time that we taught thankfulness. It was a time to ask some questions about how did your day go? What what was something good that happened to you today? Mm -hmm. uh, what was what happened in class today? What is this friend doing? And, and it was a time to teach and to listen and to learn and create a home environment that the children loved and enjoyed. Uh, the other part of that is creating family time together. Uh, I love to do games and activities and ask questions and plan times where there's interaction. So we, we did. We played games, not just for the sake of playing games, because we played games to help teach lessons. You play a game, you can learn a lot about what it means to win, what it means to lose, what how it to means teamwork. how to have teamwork. That's right. Uh, when, when video games came along and Hunter wanted to play video games and uh, we tried to work out, well, how do we do that? How do we navigate that time? We found, we found some video games that Hunter and I could do together where they were interactive play and uh, they were military type games, but they required us working together in them. We weren't just against each other. We were actually on the same team working together to accomplish goals. Yeah. So uh, it was all a learning process. I and never joined in on that. No, Heather. Oh. <laughs> Heather did not. Well, I was gonna say it was so much of like a foundation block too. That like we still, like in a sense, quote that or like we bring up that memory a lot too. Yeah. So exactly, uh, it was there that we read stories, told stories, uh, laughed and talked, used conversation starters. Those are all important um, in creating family unity, doing things together, and then uh, 
just allowing time to be family. It's tough when you're wanting to do something for all your kids and have them all involved in different activities. But don't forget the importance of just being home and being family in the home, um, making it, making home the best place to be. Sometimes in the busyness, home becomes a place you go to just to eat, just to uh, do some chores, just to do some uh, laundry, go to bed, get up and go again. Um, when that happens, you're, you're, you're teaching your children something about home, even though you may not realize it, and you're saying something to them about home. We always wanted our kids to think home was the best place to be. It was the place that was safe and secure and the place you wanted to get to. Um, the other element about making the most of family time has to do with chores. And, of course, in our family, there were seven of us, and there's a lot of stuff to be done. And so to help uh, Heather and I not be the ones who did it all and to help teach our children some lessons, life's less, life lessons, we had chores. And there were chores each day regarding meal and dishwasher loading and unloading, all of that. Uh, but there were chores on the weekends, and um, that became my task. So I would make a list. I'd call the kids in, and they would decide uh, which chore they were going to pick. And so I'd have a list of some 20 chores, and they would choose. I'm going to do these three. And then so there was a rush to get in there to see who could find the chores. Well, sort of like, sometimes it was known as like the chore list is going out at like 9 a.m., but then sometimes the chore list would just go up without like being <laughs> like announced. And so it was just like you would find out that it was there, and so you would try to get the chores you, you, you might get left with a very difficult chore. Exactly. So, uh, now this is where the story turns a little dark because for me, uh, I like order, and I want to get the task done, and so I was all about it. Okay, everybody, come on in here. Let's get our chores, and it always started off, woohoo, great. Everybody's doing a good job. Come on, yeah, and soon, you know, 30 minutes, hour passed, and someone hasn't done their chores, or someone <laughs> has halfway done their chores, and... Uh, you know, they're playing and whatever. And this is where I had to learn some patience because I would lose it in that moment. I would get frustrated. How come you're not here doing this chore? That's not the way you clean the bathroom. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> and there were times that Saturdays became unenjoyable. And Heather would have to remind me, um, I don't want to go through a Saturday and us get some work done. But at the end of the day, our kids despise us and think home is the worst place to be. So I had to change in the midst of all of that because um, getting it done, getting a task done is a far lesser goal than winning your children's heart. Now, there can be a way to do both. Right. doesn't mean you right. have to give up one in pursuit of the other, but I had to find a way to do that with some creativity and some love. Because chores are important. They are. Very important. They are. They are. So, um, Heather, sometimes we would set out on those plans and we would we would want things to go a certain way, but they didn't always. Sometimes right. they worked. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes yeah. our best plans uh, didn't turn out all that great. Yes. So uh, do you have a, a memory of a time where maybe it did go well, maybe not so well that you'd remember for our family? Yeah. Um, we definitely had the, the right and good intentions of... Um, we wanted to do family devotions before school, and um, that was a little challenging because, well, I don't think, I think Truett was still kind of young, so I think it was the four, and I think Brianna was, well, maybe Truett was there because I think Brianna was in junior high, and, you know, it took, you know, longer to get ready at that age, and um, we wanted the kids to be at the breakfast table with breakfast and their Bible open. Uh, and, I mean, man, we were fighting attitudes, bad attitudes. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to sleep in. And we got so frustrated, and we realized that this was being very counterproductive to what we were wanting to um, instill in them. In fact, it was making to do the opposite. They didn't want to have anything to do with that. So... We did have to change that. Yeah, that's a great example of, of what I'm talking about. We, we want our children to have a heart for God, but that plan was producing the opposite. Yeah. It's a good idea. It is. Get up early, read your Bible, the family all talk together. Cool. Uh, that didn't work for us. Yeah. So we had to change 
the plan, the action that we had, because it was producing the opposite result. And so we, we found that evenings work better for us mm-hmm. and something not so structured, mm-hmm. something much more fluid and organic. At the time, our kids were in a Christian school, so they'd had Bible lesson during the day. Uh, they weren't looking for another lesson, uh, much less a Bible lesson. So it became more of discussion about life. So That's what I was going to say, even about that time. Like I can't even recall like, maybe two memories of the time there we did that before school. I was, gonna, I was wondering if you remembered that. And like, I can't even tell you for the, for how long we did it. Like, yeah. To me, we probably only yeah, did it like, two times. I think it was about it. wasn't long. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, the, the times that I even just recall of like, wow, that was a really cool and fun learning time, even like whenever I was around 10 years old, was like times we would fall asleep, me and Drew would fall asleep here in the living room, and then we would wake up and you'd be working on your message in the dining room. And so going in there and having like a bowl of cereal and and then asking like, so what are you talking about tomorrow? And that was more of like how you said, kind of a spontaneous thing, but that's what really stood out to me when it comes to... Like a devotion time. Yeah, 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 that's good. Yeah, so carrying out your God, your God-given goals into a plan of action shows up first of all intentionally planning for times together at home. This has mm-hmm. to be number one. The second thing uh, that goes with that is be wise about your educational choices. Well, we live in a, a time today when there are a lot of educational options. Uh, you can public school, charter school private school, Christian school. Uh, There are are variations of those where you can do some homeschool and some Christian school together. So you have all of these options. And um, I know parents say, well, I went in this kind of format, so that's kind of want my children to be in as well. What we discovered along the way was not every child is cut out for the same educational environment. And some enjoy a school setting, others not so much. Mm -hmm. And each of our children had a completely different perspective on school. And so at times, we, we changed some things up. There were times that we had them in a Christian school setting. There were times we did some homeschooling. There were times we put them back in a Christian school setting. And we, we had to stay continually on our first goal, which was Uh, win their heart to love the Lord, win their heart to love us, and win their heart to love others. If we keep that in mind, and all of a sudden we start noticing that one of our choices, whether it be home activities or even educational choice, is preventing that, then it's time for a change. So um, it's important as parents that we don't ever say, well, I could never, You, you fill in the blank with your educational option, Homeschool, private school, Christian school, public school. I'm not sure that's wise for us to say I could never because it's not about us. It's about the child. Mm -hmm. And so if that child needs a different environment for learning, why would we not shift it so that we can accomplish our goal? Because at the end of the day, and at the end of our parenting process, we want our children's heart to be in passionate pursuit of God, in open uh, uh, connection with us, and an open love for others. And if something is preventing it, even if it's the educational choice, it's preventing it, that we should make a change. And whichever choice you go with, there's always going to be some uh, sacrifice to make that happen Mm -hmm. and some supplement that will need to happen. You're going to have to add something to whichever one you choose. If you choose homeschooling, you're probably going to need to supplement that with some public interaction at some point. Whichever choice you make, you're going to have to supplement it. The goal or the target is not the educational choice. The target is the child's heart. So choose what's best for him or them. Now, um, Hunter had a different educational uh, situation than the other four kids in our family. So um, we get Hunter's in in a Christian school through elementary up to middle school. And we started noticing um, his heart changing. Uh, He was going through some struggles in school, and it caused lots of conversations, and it it broke our heart for what he was going through at the time. And it brought about a need for change. And it was dramatic and traumatic. It was difficult. 
but we made the choice and it required some sacrifice to homeschool him while his siblings were all still in a school setting. So, uh, Hunter, talk about that situation, um, maybe a little bit about what caused it. We don't have to go into detail on that, um, but what, what that transition was like. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions here. That's what okay. that transition was like, um, what it did for you, okay. how you saw yourself now in relation to what were your friends and relation to your siblings. There's a lot. There's yeah. a lot there, but there's a lot that's needed to be said. So just help. Just coach me through my answer, though. Okay, you're I don't fine. Want to like rabbit trail Go too ahead. much, and I Go want ahead. to stay on topic. Uh, yeah, like towards uh, in ninth grade is kind of to where I started to really kind of feel like I was uh, different and isolated, and a lot of that was the people at the school with the kids in my class and uh, the teachers to where. I uh, kind of got like somewhat mentioned to where maybe I wasn't even smart enough to be there or that I was smart enough to even take those classes. And so because I was so beat down, I really started believing those things and being like, well, okay, maybe my brain is lower functioning than I really think it is. Maybe I need to go be taking special classes. I don't know what's going to happen. I just know right now I'm kind of failing every single class. To where then like, then after that we ended up meeting even with like the school board. And so then after that you feel like, man, I'm really isolating now because like I'd be like called out of a class and they're like, it's, you need to go to have this meeting. And so then like everyone in my class knows I'm about to go meet with the school board. And then uh, like things with y'all were really tense at that time yes. too. So I felt like, like extremely alone. And it was, it was such a scary there was lots time. Of, lots of conflict. Yeah. Like, I mean, those were like my prime times of like, I would come home and like my iPod was fully charged and I was ready to go on like yeah. five mile walks. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, so we make the transition. Yeah. So we make the transition school. and like this, the sales pitch in a sense, whenever you were telling me about it was like, Hey, it's not that, that you're not right for this school you're going to, but it's more so that we want to find the right solution for you. Yeah. So you're not the problem where you're at. It's kind of, it's the, the environment that you were in that was the problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's put you in the, the environment you're going to succeed in. So it's kind of like the goldfish, tell the goldfish to climb a tree. And yeah, exactly. Like yeah. It, it was very much and, like that. But he's meant for the water. Can't say that I have, but that's all right. I will find that. <laughs> um, okay. So then after that, like I, I was, I was so kind of beat down, but I was like, you know what? Fine, sounds like a good idea. I really don't want to go back to this place, anyways. So we started homeschooling, and we kind of like took that summer off, and to where there wasn't really, really that much stress because it's like I want to return to the place where everyone kind of called me an idiot and that I had a lot of mental issues. And so now going homeschool, there was this thing of like, well, hey, look, now there's all these curriculums we can pick. So which one's going to work for you the most? And it was this thing of like, it blew my mind of like, so you're telling me that I can choose something where I don't have to write that many papers, where yes. I don't have to do it this many times, that I can do it this, this way, and it's going to work out more. And to where like, when I was at the private school, math was one of like my worst subjects. And then I went to homeschool in 10th grade and I was getting like, these great grades in physics okay. to where I had friends who were taking physics at that private school. And later on they were like, Hey, I heard you were doing really good with physics. Could you help me out? And it was like this, this weirdest feeling. <laughs> but, um, then after that, things got really good between both of y'all yeah. with me and to where dad was encouraging me. And he was like, Hey, you know, at the, when I was in 11th grade homeschool, he was like, you know, you don't really have to finish this all the way and, and graduate like every other high schooler does. He's like, you've kind of already had this different high school career. You could take your GED and finish early if you want, which was another thing that just blew my mind. I was like, that's a reality? We can do that? So I studied for my GED and got to graduate even before everyone in my class, which was a really big confidence boost to me yeah. because... I left that school feeling like I was way below everyone. Yeah. Hmm. And didn't you also pick up the guitar during that time? Yeah. The yeah. music? I think that was like the right around one of my 
uh, classes for homeschool. Yeah. And it totally was another like connection thing for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. So uh, your love for listening to music became a love for creating music at yeah. that time. Yeah. And eventually became the love for being able to help produce music. That's true. And, and video, all of your technical abilities came out of that time, grew from there. Yeah. Which, even, when I was at that private school, no thought of that ever happening. Yeah. Right. It was more of like when I listened to music, like, that's cool. Someone's creating this somewhere, and that's pretty mm-hmm. awesome. But yeah. So all of that to say, uh, it's necessary to choose an educational option that works best for your child and, and frame it in that perspective. Um, not everyone fits into a classroom model. Not everyone fits into a homeschool model. Right. Find the one that works best for you and your, that did for not your work. children. That did not work for Taylor and Drew. Yeah, <laughs> if, if they were sitting at the table, they would tell you a different story yeah. about the situation. All right, let's move on to the next one. Um, the next one is make choices based on each child's unique design. Heather and I have always uh, been fascinated by uh, the idea that every person has a unique personality type, uh, a un- unique learning style, a unique love language, uh, a unique sense of humor, a set of talents, and a, and a way of processing. And so we talk about that a lot in our family. And we, we've we taken lots of profiles, and we'll talk about it together. But it helps because it helps you understand each child's uniquenesses. And you don't then have to make uh, one child like another child. And you don't measure one child against another child. Hey, here's a plug for next week. We're going to be talking about focus on the cookie and not the cookie cutter. We'll be talking more about what this means and how you do this. But... Uh, This is something we've had to do along the way, and that means uh, adjusting how we parent even for each child, changing the way we communicate and changing how we relate to them, and then changing even how we parent as they grow older. How you parent one child at three and seven may will not be the same way you parent them at 10 or 15. And a wise parent has to know how to adjust along the way to the uniquenesses of each child and parent them in the way they need to be parented. So, uh, Heather, talk about this for just a moment, what that was like for you. And we'll just put it in the context of Hunter since he's the one here tonight. Uh, talk about um, some changes that you had to make along the way. Uh, I have as well, but yeah. for you specifically <laughs> in this situation in, in relating to Hunter. Yes. Well, um, when Hunter was little, I noticed that he would, um, anytime I would give him a direction or a, uh, you know, this is what you need to do, he would always repeat it back to me. And I realized that he was more of an auditory learner. And um, so I would keep that in mind. And um, that was a little different than our older two that were more of the visual learners. And so, um, that was, I had had adjusted a little bit there, but, um, honestly, when he hit about the junior high years, uh, he was pretty compliant child, young child. And then when he hit the junior high years, it was like a flip, a, a switch flipped. Is that right? Flip yeah, switch. Like yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's what right. happened. Um, and the the way I disciplined no longer was effective for him. You know, taking away privileges and all that. He became very. Um, I don't know if I don't know if rebellious is the word as much as just um, reactionary. reactionary. That's that's a that's what it was toward me. And so I had to take more of a hands-off approach, and really, that's when it was all about dad disciplining and directing. Uh, He needed that stronger male uh, model. I think that's fairly typical for for young young guys. Um, It certainly was, and uh, we we tend to lock horns at that time anyway, and. so we did get past that. Totally. And, um, you know, we have very different personalities, mm-hmm. but um, we uh, certainitely have learned to adjust to all that. Definitely. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what we have to do in the process of parenting is, is make adjustments for every child, but for periods of time as well. 
and it creates this very fluid situation that really causes parents to have to talk together a lot yes. and seek direction a lot and pray a lot. And we did that during those times. And there were some times we didn't have the answers. And we cried a lot. Yeah. I was yeah. say, right now it all sounds like, oh, yeah. we did this two things and it was all fine. Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it didn't. It didn't work that way. There were right. lots of uh, nights where we went to bed with without answers yeah. and wondering what was going to happen and us in tears and 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 there'd be tension and but that's not where we are today. Right. But it was because I believe we intentionally made choices to change for the sake of each child, in this case mm-hmm. for Hunter's sake. Uh, again, the goal win his heart to love God win his heart to love us, and win his heart to love others, which included his siblings. Um, The next one is be wise about the activities you choose. Uh, There's a lot of activities available for parents today. Man, there's... uh, uh, you can put your child in all kind of lessons today and activities that are extracurricular, that are outside the school day. And some of those are great. Some of those can be very helpful. They can be fun. They can be inspirational and challenging and learning moments for your children. But it's important to know this. Activities are a tool and they're not the goal. And children's interests change over time. Uh, there was a time Hunter was involved in, in baseball, and he was a great pitcher. And we thought, wow, we're going to be doing this for a long time. But one year he said, eh, I'm done. Okay, well, we're through with that then. And so we moved on. We didn't insist that he get into it. And um, others were, had different activities of interest as well. The thing that's important as parents is that you're continually evaluating these, these things. What Can we afford this, number one? (laughs) Two, is this helping us in the long-term goal for our hearts of our children? Is this this working for us? And if you get into it and you find that the activity, whatever it might be, is becoming more of a deterrent or a distraction to helping your children love God, love you, and love others, then it's time to reevaluate that activity. It might be time to move on. Might be time to let it go. Might be time to say, you know, we need some more time at home just to be family. Um, Then choose activities based on your goals. And then with that, talk and evaluate your progress often. Uh, Talk about it as, as mom and dad. Evaluate it continually. And then even talk with your children about how they think it's going. Get their input. See what their interest is. And if those extracurricular activities are uh, of little interest to them, then it's probably a good indicator of of pulling out of that thing and saying, well, let's move on. Let's go on to something else. We watched our kids over the years get involved in different activities, like I said, with Hunter and others. We thought, well, this is going to be something they'll do for a long time. But Things change. Yeah. Sometimes they were involved with it because just their friends were, because it seemed fun, but then that ended. So talk about that. For us, that led to a lot of great conversations, and sometimes it even led to some family conversations. Um, there were times that we would bring the kids together after Heather and I had talked. We would say, well, let's have a family meeting, and let's talk about where we are right now. Let's talk about... Um, how we're doing with uh, our relationships in the family. Let's talk about uh, how we're doing with chores. Let's talk about responsibilities versus free time. We had a lot of family time meetings like that, a lot of conversations about what are we going to do this summer and what's this going to look like. And So, uh, Hunter, talk for just a moment about what you remember about family Mm -hmm. meetings, what that was like, and Mm -hmm. um, kind of the impact that those were for you. Well, uh, first of all, I would say growing up, I felt like family meetings were kind of just like a standard thing. And so once I was talking to like some of my friends, maybe whenever I was like 13 or so, and I was like, well, we talked about this in our family meeting. And they're like, oh, what? (laughs) Y'all do that? Why is it? And I was like, y'all don't do that? You're never on the same page. So, I mean, they were, they're definitely because of like some tense times. We'd have a family meeting call, but they were always like completely worth it to have because things would get so tense where like everyone was on separate pages so at a family meeting we would all know okay well this is like our family's goal now yeah um one of like our 
family meeting that we'll kind of like bring up and laugh about a lot is one time to where we were, we went to Chick-fil-A. And I don't know if we knew there was going to be a family meeting there, but while we were there, dad's like, all right, let's have a family meeting. I want to like be honest and tell you all about some ideas, how we've been parenting. And he sat all of us down and kind of essentially like taught this class to us <laughs> and told us like, hey, look, when we had Brianna, we thought this was like the perfect way to parent. Then we had Holly, we found out that's not the perfect way to parent. Then we had Hunter, and it was different. We had Taylor, and it was different. And True, and it was different. So they were like, we've changed a lot throughout our parenting. And we'll admit, like, we didn't always know the right answer the whole time, but we had to do this. And it was just this time of where, like, all of the kids kind of had their mind blown of, like, <laughs> you're admitting that you didn't know what you were doing when you were parenting us? <laughs> yeah. But there was so much of that, the way it was conveyed, we, we knew there was so much love in the way y'all were trying to parent and attempting to parent so everyone came out of it super excited we had that conversation and it was yeah, great it was good hey let me wrap up here with a couple more things that are important as you as you build activities around your goal um, include time with extended family one of the things that is so essential in helping ground your children is helping them see that they are a part of something much larger when you put your children into the home of, of your parents, their grandparents, and you put them into the home of, of, of your grandparents, and they all of a sudden see they're part of something much larger, and they see reinforced goals, and they see love happening beyond just them, it really grounds them and gives them perspective. So uh, include time with extended family, with aunts and uncles and cousins and, and relatives on both sides as much as you're able, and, and help your children see the need to love them. And then build uh, your family around a whole life view of faith. Let your children see, as we mentioned earlier, that this faith thing is not just a Sunday morning thing. Mm -hmm. This faith thing that we do is our life. It's all that we do. And as you build around what encourages that and remove what discourages that, you will be much more effective in accomplishing your goals. And then the last thing, make your home the central place of learning, faith, and love. Do all you can to drive toward that goal. In our session number seven of this series, we're going to talk about how to make home the greatest place on earth. As you do that, as you build activities and family time and home time around your three goals, you will see in time, in the process, you'll see the reward of your labor. Labor. You'll see the fruit that comes from all that you're planting right now. There's a couple of books listed there I'd recommend for you as well. And then the final page of the handouts tonight is a homework page. This is something for mom and dad to take and talk through. It's some practical questions. It would be some great conversation for you about what are we doing and how can we shape the activities that we do in our home and outside of our home to make sure they're accomplishing our goals. As you do that, uh, you're going to find your children loving God, loving you, and loving each other. So I hope you'll follow us uh, next week as we get to session three, focus on the cookie, not the cookie cutter. And I hope you'll follow Vertical Church online and keep up with us as we continue to minister and serve our community. Thanks for being with us tonight.